All right, we're on to section 9.2. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're learning things about intelligence. Uh, so lesson two is on the measure, measurement of intelligence. This is a very brief lesson. Uh, we're not gonna spend a lot of time in this chapter because we have more things to do and there's only a month left of school. <clears throat> All right. So measurement of intelligence. So again, have your note sheet out. Uh, I oftentimes go through an example of the of an intelligence test, and I have a link uh, on your notes, but um, that link's been removed, so uh, we don't get to do that. All right, the Stanford Binet scale. So this was developed by the French psychologist Alfred Binet in 1905. And then it was revised by Lewis Terman, who worked for Stanford University at the time. And that's where the name Stanford Binet scale comes from. So you're looking at a picture of Alfred Binet there. So they don't call it the uh, Terman Binet, but the Stanford Binet, as Lewis Terman was working for Stanford University. As you've come to realize, Stanford University has done a lot for psychology. Well, this is what we, you know, the classic intelligence test. The first time we start using the term IQ, which stands for intelligence quotient. You might have thought, well, that's a funny name. Uh, the mathematically inclined amongst us might have thought, you know, quotient means the answer to a division problem. What division are we doing? Well, we're taking the mental age of a child. The Stanford Binet test was designed for children. So the intellectual level a children is a child is functioning at, we divide that by their chronological age, how old they are, and you multiply that by 100. That's their IQ score. So if you have an IQ of 100, that means your mental age and your chronological age are the same. So 100 for an IQ is average. And then, um, yeah, so then, most people's IQ fall between like 90 and 110. Um, that's about one standard deviation. And then uh, it gets significantly, you know, if, you're, if your IQ is um, like 120, 130, that would be considered quite gifted. And this is just an example of a trans transformed score, which is a, a, a score that's changed from a raw score in a systematic way. So uh, if, you, if you think of like um, the test that comes to my mind, it's like the ACT, uh, the top score is a 36, but that's a transformed score. You, it's not the actual score you got on the different parts of the test. It's, it's, uh, it's calculated. Uh, if you take the CLEP test, that's a transform score. They're going to give you a score between, I think, 40 and 80. And it doesn't, it's not your percent. Uh, it's a transform score based on how difficult the questions are and how many you get right and whatnot. So here's Mr. Wexler, who developed the Wexler Adult intelligence scale. So unlike the Stanford Binet, which was mainly children, this is uh, used for adults. It's the most widely used intelligence test today. It has several different um, subtests. Uh, so verbal, um, arithmetic, etc. And then a nonverbal. And then um, so his both both Binet and Wexler both believed that intelligence was very complex. Intelligence was very complex, and you can't describe it with just a number. But many believe the Wexler scale does a much better job, kind of delineating where strengths and weaknesses are of a given individual. And you know, Binet's purpose with the intelligence quotient, his original IQ test, was to help place kids, you know, which kids needed extra help or et cetera. And Wexler's scale is useful to diagnose certain learning disabilities as well. It doesn't use mental age 
but uh, still kind of comes up with an idea of like an IQ. Uh, the next question there is why are intelligence tests valuable? That's on your note sheet. And so I try to, I kind of answer that throughout, just basically like identifying where strengths and weaknesses are for children. We have this kind of goofy school system where we just shove everybody in grades based on their chronological age, which, you know, you could have a kid who is uh, really gifted in math, but really slow in reading or writing or spelling. And yet they're all lumped together. So you could have someone who's like, and they do these goofy things where they say like, oh, you're at a fourth grade reading level. Uh, speaking of elementary kids, you have like a first grader. Oh, you're at a fourth grade reading level, but you're, you know, below age level in math. Well, in a, in a school setting, we just kind of shove them, you know, oh, so he, but he's still going to be taking reading and math with other kids who are at varying levels themselves. It's, it's really kind of a difficult system. Uh, but <clears throat> anyway, so intelligence tests help us to identify where kids are strong and where they're weak, and, and that's useful. All right, define reliability. So re reliability means consistency. If you take a standardized test multiple times, you should get very similar results. That's reliability. So if you were to go um, take the SAT and your scores were hundreds of points different uh, over the course of just a few months, well, that's, that's not very reliable. Uh, if you were to take, um, you know, the CLEP test, for example, and same thing, where if like you take it once and you fail miserably, and then, you know, six weeks later you take it again and you get one of the highest scores. Well, that's not very reliable. A reliable test, if you take it multiple times, you'll get very similar results unless you've done something significant to change your preparation. Uh, so we, we have a term we call test retest reliability. So take the same test at different times, your score should be similar. That's what that means, test, retest. You take the test multiple times, you should get similar results. Old reliable. All right, validity. For a test to be valid, it should measure uh, what it's supposed to. So intelligence tests should predict achievement. Uh, if you take a psychology CLEP test, it should measure that you are proficient enough in psychology to pass a semester of college. Um, if you were to take a psychology CLEP test and it had all kinds of questions about British literature, uh, Near East philosophy, et cetera, and you just bomb the test, um, and then you take it again six weeks later, and it's has a bunch of the similar questions, not much to do with psychology at all, and you bomb it again. It's a very reliable test, but it's not very valid because it's not it's not measuring what it's supposed to measure. So when we talk about testing, we want tests to be reliable, meaning if you took it multiple times, you get similar results. We want them to be valid. We want them to measure what, what they're supposed to be measuring. So when I give you a test over chapters nine and 10 in psychology, I want it to measure how proficient are you in the topics in chapters nine and 10. That's validity. So some would say it's difficult to say anything definitive about the validity of intelligence tests because, well, they're very complicated. And there's so many different views on what, does, what makes intelligence. All right, problems. So this is the last thing on page two. What are some limitations of intelligence tests? So your, obviously your economic background. So education kind of makes sense. Uh, but your economic background, your socioeconomic background can make a difference on intelligence tests. It used to, so the statistic there, poor children usually score 10 to 15 points lower. Now, it could be because they lack resources. It could be too that the testing itself is using uh, middle to upper class 
scenarios and language that are unfamiliar to people in lower conditions. Uh, and that's a real problem. So I remember looking at an example where they were talking about, uh, they had a, a, a test on an intelligence um, scale referring to a yacht race. And it's like, you know, if you're from a working class, et cetera, background, I mean, what do you know about yacht races? Well, probably not much, but if you're from the upper class, uh, maybe that's a lot more familiar to you. So th th there's some bias in the in the test questions. So other, you know, obviously motivation. Uh, Benet realized this motivation. If the kid's not motivated, they're going to bail on the test, and that can skew results. And there's cultural bias. So you're asking questions that different cultures would find easy to answer, and other cultures more difficult. So. There's, there's a lot that goes into test making. Okay, so now we're going to switch gears and I'm gonna show you this video on um, a savant called Leslie Lemke. So savant is a uh, um, someone who who is very limited in many ways with intelligence but uh, has astounding gifts in a certain area so this fella was an adopted child who is blind or lost his eyes and but has a phenomenal musical gift so i'm going to share that with you Leslie Lemke is a living example of what can happen when someone has the courage to see beyond the hardships. Given up by his natural mother at birth, Leslie was blind, mentally handicapped, and suffered from cerebral palsy. His fight began early in life, but thanks to the courage and love of May Lemke, he did not have to fight alone. May and her husband, Joe, lived in a small cottage on Pewaukee Lake, a short distance to the west of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. May was a retired nurse governess and had raised five children of her own. Instead of relaxing and taking life a little easier, the Lemkes received approval to start a foster care home. She and her husband decided to care for Leslie as yet another challenge. Now my mother is a very British lady. And for those of you who know the British, she's very stubborn. They said, you think about it a while. We'll bring him out, we'll show him to you, then you decide. She says, I don't have to think about it. You bring that lad out, I'll take care of him. But he is not coming to my house to die. You'll see, he will not die. When they brought Leslie to Pewaukee Lake for the first time. He had just had his eyes surgically removed. And he was not a pretty sight to see. He could not move, he could not cry, and he had a very difficult time swallowing. The first thing she did was teach Leslie how to swallow better. And I can remember her mixing gruel placing it on the back of his tongue, stroking his throat so he swallowed involuntarily. As he grew and he learned how to sit up and learned how to pull himself up, she realized that he wasn't going to be able to walk. He was two and a half years old and he still was not able to stand on his feet and make one foot go in front of the other. So she thought of a very unique idea. She took it to Daddy Joe and she said, can you devise this strap somehow so that I can strap this around myself and Leslie so that it will hold him up against me and maybe 
he will get the feeling of how to walk if he feels the vibration of me walking. And so this is what she did. With unconditional love, May kept pressing on. She had taught Leslie to eat and to walk. Major accomplishments for someone the doctors thought was sure to die in his infancy. But May Lemke was not satisfied with this. She wanted to discover Leslie's full potential. As the years went by, some hidden abilities began to surface. Now, Leslie couldn't talk. He couldn't talk to you, but he could mimic, and he could repeat, and he loved doing this. I can remember many times he would lay in bed all night long, mimicking everything he'd heard on television, keeping us all awake. See, he got days and nights mixed up. He didn't care whether it was day or it was night to make any difference to him. Everything was night to Leslie. After this, we all decided that we were going to give Leslie every kind of musical toy that was available. I can remember that he had the bongo drums, and he played those bongo drums. We gave him a ukulele, learned how to play tunes on that. And it was when he was about eight years old that mother decided, well, I think I'm going to get him a second-hand piano. Let's see what he can do with this. So she would place Leslie on this piano. She would run her fingers over it. She would play her little English tunes. She would sing to Leslie. She would say, Leslie, this is a piano. This is how you play a piano, and this is what I want you to do. He learned how to play that piano. And as the years went by, he got better and better and better. Then came that particular evening that so many of you have heard about. When we say that Leslie came into the full bloom of this miracle. Mother was awakened one evening to hear very, very beautiful music. She thought that Daddy Joe had left the television on. When he says, no, I haven't, she crept out of bed, went to Leslie's room, and discovered Leslie sitting by the piano, playing flawlessly all the way through what was known to Leslie at that time as Liberace's theme song. We would recognize it. Leslie's never ever seen a piece of music or has he ever been taught how to read or anything like this. He simply duplicates what he hears. If you close your eyes while he's playing, you will realize that he is almost exactly duplicating the sound of a normal piano player. I'd like to take the first song that Leslie sings to dedicate to our creator by telling God how great he is and how great thou art.
Leslie has the condition and he represents one of the most spectacular cases of the Savant syndrome. Leslie is blind, he is intellectually uh, limited with an IQ of about 40, and he has cerebral palsy. And yet he has an astonishing uh, musical ability and a prodigious memory. You can play a piece for him but once and he'll recall it uh, flawlessly, no matter the complexity or the length, and he can recall that at any point in the future that you want him to uh, play it back uh, for you. Leslie's ability to mimic is not limited to the simple reproduction of a melody. He can copy musical styles as well. Often, he entertains his concert audience with impersonations of great musicians from the past. So many questions leap up, for example, how is this possible? Or how can these islands exist in the sea of disability? Or with all the skills in the human repertoire, how come it narrows down to such few things, including the obscure skill of calendar calculating, for example? Why does that combination of blindness, retardation, and uh, musical ability keep recurring as it has these last uh, 100 years in, in the 200 cases reported? And why does the Savant syndrome occur more frequently in males, six times more frequently, in fact, uh, than females? The memory that the Savants share in common, I think, may provide some clues to understanding our own memory. Their extraordinary brain function perhaps can give us some clues to our ordinary brain function, and in better understanding them, we can probably understand ourselves. But there's more to the Savant syndrome than brain circuitry and retrieval and other kinds of scientific questions. There also are some tremendous human interest stories of belief, determination, love, perseveration, cheerleading, coaching, and simple belief in someone who has a handicap. Beyond the science and inquiry, then, is the inspiration that these people can provide to the caretakers and the families as well. In trying to understand the savant and the condition that they have, we want to understand the savant himself or herself not just the condition that they do have. It's important to remember that each savant is a miracle. It's a miracle of uniqueness, of belief, and of determination. By learning about that uniqueness and by studying something uh, of the inspiration, this mix of scientific and human interest can get us further ahead than we've ever been in trying to understand both science and human potential. The savant syndrome is a challenge to our capabilities and they're an inspiration to our possibilities. And I think that they provide a key to understanding not only the savant, but also ourselves. The 
savant syndrome is a unique condition. Unique in the sense that persons possessing such great mental and physical limitations can exhibit such amazing talent. And what about us? Do these skills lie within each of us? Do we all possess this type of genius, but somehow forget to express it? Or do we erase it before we can share it with each other? The complexity of the savant syndrome may never be fully understood, but there are lessons we can learn from them. If these people are able to express such love and beauty despite their hardships, what of us? What is our potential? Doctors told May Lemke that her adopted son would never live, but she was determined. As individuals, we may not possess great skills in music and art or mathematical genius, but all of us do have certain talents, and we all have the capability as May Lemke to share our love and our determination. The power of love that May Lemke possessed broke down the barriers that would have kept Leslie from ever reaching his island of genius. Okay, so that's Leslie Lemke. You see this amazing story of how God used these people to cultivate in him this musical gift and then how he's been using it to sing to God's praise. If you think of Psalm 8, right? The weakest means fulfill God's will. So hopefully uh, you, uh, you enjoyed that and learned something from it about intelligence.